So 1819 was alive the year of political activity. Radicals and reformers protested, marched, and petitioned for parliamentary reform and suffrage. The voting system was rotten and did not represent its people. Playing an important role in this movement were groups of women who formed female reform societies. They gathered to speak, make gifts and political material culture, and to lend their support to the mass movement which was growing across the, uh, Britain in the late 1810s. So the female reformers faced strong critique and insult through print and press. Their gender, their presence in the landscape, and the performances can be read as queer. So this paper aims to explore the gender and gendered performance of female reformers, understanding in terms of sedition, subversion and queerness. These combine together to read the female reformers as having or performing a female masculinity. It recognises how we can use queer theory as a way of understanding their involvement in radicalism and how they constructed their own identities. And perhaps this research is also pertinent with our current political climate and they can help us think about how we today construct political women's identities. Historical archaeology should be contributing to contemporary discourse and should not shy away from being explicitly political. And it is hoped that this analysis of Regency female reformers will, without making explicit reference to, help us think about how the media, the public and authority conceive of the body politic. And here on this slide, and indeed on the previous one, we have the usual depiction of women in politics from the contemporary period, helpless, pretty much. This print is called Liberty Suspended, and it uses the female depiction of liberty to highlight how in 1817 the two acts curtailed rights and liberties for British citizens. Exploring the efforts of the female reformers helps us to realign our understandings of what Lady Liberty can be. So the concept of female masculinity is a useful one. Female reformers were viewed as transgressing their gender, but also their sex in the contemporary language. In a similar way, we can see how butch lesbians today are often accused of trying to be like men, and this is a critique female reformers also received. From the outset, it's important to recognise that female masculinity should not be placed on a spectrum which opposes it with female femininity, nor can it be reduced to the female performance of male masculinity. Masculinity is not only located, performed or cited within the male body, whether biological or constructed. Additionally, nonconformity signals either rejection of or challenge not only to established gender structures and hierarchies, but to the rules, regulations and, expe um, hang on, and expectations that uphold these. Female masculinity has been largely unconsidered in archaeological and historical research, with exceptions relating to lesbianism, and the emphasis instead of being what can be called masculine femininity, semantics maybe, oh well, especially in the theatre. The notable exception of this is the work of Kathleen Wilson, who studied ideas surrounding the body and female masculinity in the French and the Napoleonic Wars. But it's also important to consider where I, as the researcher, sit amongst all of this. Involving the queer self does not only have to be related to the study of sex and sexuality or the origins of homosexuality, nor does it have to be at odds with feminism due to its anti-essentialism. As explored by love, queer history or archaeology can be, and indeed should be, about navigating the dark side of the past, recognising the power of loss, grief and wounds. This emphasis on feeling connection with the past as lost and attempting to study social, cultural or emotional people resonates greatly with this paper. The very experience or performance of queerness requires a process of looking into the self, but it's also acknowledging a preference for being othered. As explored by Thomas Dowson, there can be pressure on LGBTQ academics to be hidden and to separate sexuality from archaeology. This recognition in relation to myself, where my academic and my personal lives are not constituted as being distinct spheres, and how queerness necessitates inwardness, permits the questioning of how the analysis is actually shaped. Simply put, does the analysis conceive of female reformers as deviant, othered, or masculine because of my own experiences? And then, does it matter? And it's just going to briefly have an overview of what I mean by landscape in this paper. I use the idea of the sublime, which was a, re a contemporary idea in the Regency period. In some of his travel writing, the radical John Fellwall explored landscape as being inseparable from social interaction, with landscape being referred to as the sublime of human nature. 
conservatives, both in terms of politics and social beliefs, also use the idea of the sublime. Edmund Burke's argument is also useful as it permits a deeply emotional response that provokes or inspires a moral choice or reaction, not through overpowering terror, but, in his own words, attachment to, awareness of, and commitment to not only objects, but also cultures and communities. With this permitting, again in his own words, political acts for a profound sense of his or her limitations made aware for the experience of sublime's external magnitude. Although writing about dangerous landscapes of cliffs, storms and turbulent seas, the suggestion of landscape being a vehicle of terror by Wilton and Barringer in their 2002 paper is undoubtedly an appealing term for understanding radical landscapes and the landscape of female reform as it permits the idea of being within the landscape and it being a source of emotion. And just a little bit of context as well before we go into the analysis. Following the French Revolution in the 1790s, fears and anxieties surrounding similar uprisings and overthrows were common amongst the middling and upper classes of, of Europe. In Britain, the government would combat radical methods through legislation, for example, suspending the right of habeas corpus and to meet in groups larger than 50 people. Whilst radicalism did not disappear, it lost momentum during the Napoleonic Wars, but following the end of these, the Corn Laws were introduced and it proved to be a highly unpopular measure, resulting in grain prices uh, becoming very expensive and it was exacerbated by a string of poor harvests. So from about 1815, we see radicalism begin to grow again. Famous events of the period were the Pentridge Rising, in which a group of men marched from Derbyshire to Nottingham as they thought they would meet a revolutionary force there, and the Blanket March, where a few thousand Lancashire textile workers aimed to march from St. Petersfield, Manchester to London to hand in a petition to the Prince Regent. And perhaps the most famous event of the period was in 1819, shortly afterwards, shortly after the first uh, female reform societies were formed, is the Peterloo Massacre, in which 18 reformers were killed and hundreds injured as the authorities violently dispersed the meeting which attempted to petition for the right to vote. So in July 1819, several female reform societies were formed, all in the northwest of England initially. And the first of these was in Blackburn, Lancashire, with their first meeting being presented here in this rather unflattering cartoon, which is by George Cruikshank, who was a reformer, but only so far. The first platform meeting of female reformers happened in, in Blackburn itself as well, at a general meeting in the pursuit of reform on the 5th of July 1819. It was chaired by Mr John Knight, a prominent radical from Manchester, and the women appeared at the entrance of the ground and, according to the York Herald, were desirous of approaching the hustings, to which the chairman asked the crowd to make a pathway, and they immediately did. The ladies, as they are often called by um, Whig newspapers, received much applause and acclamations, which took several minutes to end. Crucially, the women sought to give the piece of material culture to the chair. The ladies then stepping forward towards the chairman, one of them, with becoming diffidence and respect, presented him with a most beautiful cap of liberty, made of scarlet silk or satin, with a serpentined gold lace, terminating with a rich gold tassel. And that's what we can see happening here at the moment. The gift was accepted upon Alice Kitchens, the chairwoman of the female reformer's short speech. Will you, kind sir, accept this token of our respect to those brave men who are nobly struggling for liberty and life? By placing it on the head of your banner, you will confer a lasting obligation on the female reformers of Blackburn. It was promptly hoisted onto the banner pole, as requested, amidst great applause. The chairman held the female reformers' address in his hands, and the crowd encouraged him to read it by shouting, Read, 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 the women forever. And part of the address is apparently as follows. In presenting this cap of liberty, which we trust no ruffian bandetti will be allowed to wrest from your hands, we, the female reformers of Blackburn, therefore earnestly entreat you and every man in England in the most solemn manner to come forward and join the great union. At the end of the meeting, a series of resolutions were passed and one of them includes a vote of thanks for the female reformers. And so following the Blackburn meeting, one of the common occurrences at future female reform meetings was the presentation of liberty caps. So shortly after the Peterloo massacre, Leeds and Huddersfield also formed their own societies 
and the women made special and splendid caps, as they know, were known, to give to the chair at their first meetings. And these were above the usual standard due to the material choice, often silk, and by being accessorised with added ribbons and tassels. Therefore, reformer women were making liberty and crafting their contribution to the cause. And perhaps the choice of the cap was made as liberty and justice who were, were usually depicted as female and often held a pole with a liberty cap upon it, meaning that the liberty cap was seen as a fitting way of performing a female radicalism. So looking out from the female reformer's perspective, they were not viewing themselves in terms of female masculinity, that's something I'm putting on top of them. Rather, they were finding ways within the established radical tradition to contribute in feminine ways. This therefore leads to an interesting consideration for my reading of them having or doing a female masculinity may actually align closer to the criticisms and commentary they received, which I will discuss next. So they produced quite the national controversy, their formation. Um, they, Truman's extra fine post said, the public scarcely need to be informed that the females are women well known to be the most abandoned of their sex. For this quote, not only highlighting ideas of gender deviancy, but arguing that reformers, especially female reformers, were outside of the public. Crookshank's print as well, featured here again, highlights several key themes and issues surrounding female reformers, including disgust or horror at women transgressing gender boundaries, questioning their moral character, and questioning the relationship between the woman reformer, family and offspring. For example, you have one woman here dressed in yellow, holding aloft her child, who's depicted as a dwarfish Jacobin, is um, able to mock in relation to the French Revolution. We can also see sexual deviancy through the placing of the liberty cap upon the pole placed between a male reformer's legs, whilst the leader of the woman states, this amongst here is quite a small text, unfortunately, will you accept this token of our love and by placing it on your pole? So the use of the word pole plus the positioning of both banner and male reformer have very clear phallic connotations. But we can also see sexuality in the body combining elsewhere too, this time in a different satirical take on female reformers. Much wanted a reform amongst females. Compared to Cruikshank's efforts, her uh, fatness does not feature as much, but I'll come to this a bit later. But we do have phallic imagery, uh, with the woman on the far right holding a liberty pole between her legs, whilst the woman next to her is perhaps using her hands to create a piece of vulvate symbolism. The chairwoman who is given the address is also being mocked through sexual humour and ineptness. I feel great pleasure in holding this finger bob in my hand. But one of the other ways that they are mocked is by, a be, by being considered fat. So in a wider cultural setting, her forefathers argued that the late 18th and early 19th centuries were crucial in the acceleration of the anti-fat sentiment. Women's bodies became <coughs> excessive, demonstrate the inability to control themselves, and it was a sign of being sexually moral or loose and being impolite. So perhaps the utilisation of fat as a form of mockery links to fears of women taking up too much space in the political arena and landscape and overstepping their gender boundaries. So we can see that in other prints of the time that fat is linked to excess in other cartoons, so especially in relation to the Prince of Wales and Queen Caroline, and therefore Cruikshank was using a recognisable trope. But interestingly, male bodies are also shown in a grotesque manner, but they are normally done in a lighter way, with their bodies being more comparable to normative ones. And so this absence of fat occurs in two ways, uh, either for the normative body or an emancipated body. So despite being reviled individuals in the conservative press, John Felwall, Wilkes, Payne, Burdett and Hunt were rarely if ever fatter than the depictions or satire. But for a recurring theme within prints that depicted the French Revolution and Napoleon was the unhealthy thinness of the radicals. Here we have Thomas Rowlandson's Reform Advised, Reform Begun, Reform Complete, contrasting the plumpness of the British with the skeleton frames of the French. So fat can also be a positive trait as well in terms of having an excess of character. Therefore, the female reformers constructed a space that was seen as threatening and it needed to be mocked and devalued. To the outsider and to some reformers, the female reformers were being transgressive with their gender and were having their femininity undermined by being considered fat. 
But the use of fat towards female reformers is a distinct feature of 1819, meaning that the combination of fat as feminine and women performing male roles produces a female masculinity. So on the 16th of August 1819, groups of reformers from across Manchester and its neighbouring towns marched to St Peter's Field to protest the lack of suffrage, and this became known as the Peterly Massacre, as I mentioned earlier. On the hustings, just very, you can barely see her, is Mary Fylde, the chairwoman of the Fem Manchester Female Reform Society. And Henry Hunt, who is on the hustings, he's holding the hat, that's him there, um, wrote about it in his memoirs, his prison memoirs. We very soon met the Manchester Committee of Female Reformers, headed by Mrs Fylde, who bore in her hand a small white silk flag. As, though rather small, she was a remarkably good figure and well-dressed. It was justly considered that she added much to the beauty of the scene, and as she was a married woman of good character, her appearance in such a situation by no means diminished the respectability of the procession. So we can see that clothing was one way, another way, that they uh, used material culture to participate in radicalism in what they considered a feminine means. So again, we have a tension between how the female reformers wanted to be read and how they are considered. This tension or discomfort in itself is queer, allowing for multiple perspectives, viewpoints, and thinking in terms of identities over identity. So it's important to remember that the destabilising impact of the female reformers' performances was also critiqued by women. It was reported with repugnance that women reacted with compassion and disgust equally blended as seeing the march of Peterloo. And these wretched creatures should forget how much more protected than restrained by the barrier that separates them from the toil of public business. The old and female reform society depicted here in the film Peterloo from this year um, were processing and a group of women from Manchester shouted at them, go home to your families and leave matters like this to your husbands. And these attacks left the political landscape and into domestic space as well. Uh, we can see that they were considered to have abandoned their proper domestic cares and given themselves up to the mania of amending the constitution. Our satirical take on the women highlights concerns that they were putting too much effort into political life. In the pamphlet, a husband of a female reformer says, since our Debbie has turned speechmaker, the children are all in rags. And I will finish with one last consideration about uh, female reformers' bodies. And the body is an important physical element in their performance, and therefore it's necessary to highlight how it would be considered a contested site. So attempts were made at distinguishing the sexes further in this period to react against the feminine involvement in the public sphere, which is much better explained by Linda Colley's book. A common term used for female reformers was Amazons or Amazonian. The idea of the Amazonian woman held particular connotations in the Regency period due to a shift from seeing them as heroic or courageous to transgressive, threatening and lacking traditional femininity. So in the account of Peterloo, Mary Waterworth for the Stockport female reformers is called a profligate Amazon for her role in sitting on the box of Barouche carrying a society's banner. This frequent referral to women as Amazons was noted by reformers in the York trial of those arrested at Peterloo. A witness, John Smith, stated that he thought the women did not merit the terms of profligate Amazons. The performance undertaken by radicals at Peterloo of marching in time and rank, as well as the material culture of banners and wreaths, resulted in Waterworth's body becoming a site of tension between her gender and fear of violence. A mocking poem, which was featured on the previous slide, also explores the idea of the female reformer as Amazon. But she, the Amazon of strife and storm, of mind, hermaphrodite in woman's form. These references combined to emphasise how removed female reformers are from their gender and how they are occupying space. Ideas and events that are presumed to be exclusively for men. The dual nature of woman warrior and sexual duality of male female is a neat way of capturing the feeling towards, fe towards female reformers and their performances in contemporary Regency discourse. And just to really, really quickly conclude, and in a very clever move, I didn't actually print the last page off, so I'll read it from my phone. <laughs> Although I hope I have demonstrated how the gender of female reformers can be seen as contested, multifaceted and queer, with the multiple spectres allowing for a nuanced reading. 
Female reformers were constructing their own version of radicalism and finding ways to contribute for their femininity. They did this through clothing, processions and material culture. Despite their efforts, they came under attack with their bodies, their sexualities and their domesticity being critiqued. My own reading of them performing female masculinity extends from my own gender and queering these impassioned women who contributed to the right to secure the vote. But I just want to finish on, on the words of Susanna Saxton, who was a secretary for the Manchester City Royal Reform Society, and I feel like her words actually resonate with our current political situation. From very mature and deliberate consideration, we are fully convinced that, under the present system, the day is near at hand when nothing will be found in our, our unhappy country but luxury, idleness, dissipation and tyranny on the one hand, and abject poverty, slavery, wretchedness, misery and death on the other. Thank you very much. Thank you.